All right, well, I'll uh, get underway here. Um, welcome to the uh, criminal justice panel. Uh, I'm sorry that uh, things are so tight, but it shows the interest among the conservative movement for, uh, for these issues. Um, this is gonna be a discussion uh, rather than uh, set speeches. I'm just gonna sit here. I have Lyme disease and it's tough to get up and move around, so I apologize for that. Uh, the speakers can uh, speak from the uh, dais here or go up and use the, uh, the podium as they choose. Uh, I'm Pat Nolan. I'm with the American Conservative Union Foundation. Uh, uh, they've established a Center for Criminal Justice Reform. This has become such an issue among conservatives that uh, we have uh, the center established to use ACU's muscle to uh, try to uh, effectuate these reforms. Um, and uh, I'll uh, introduce the panel and then I'll just give a little framing of the issue and then we'll just bat, bat it around amongst ourselves. Uh, we're really honored here to have uh, Governor Brown back uh, of Kansas. Uh, <laughs> uh, he, uh, he's been a champion of uh, criminal justice reform uh, long before it was cool for conservatives uh, to be uh, for it. He, uh, every major effort in the last uh, 15 years in uh, Congress, either when he was in the House or the Senate and now as governor of Kansas, every major issue on criminal justice reform, it's uh, Mr. Brownback that's been the catalyst behind it and the driving force, trying to apply conservative principles to the criminal justice system. And uh, without his leadership, we would not have had the Prison Rape Elimination Act or the Second Chance Act, so many good pieces of legislation that he gave his leadership on. And now he's uh, facing the challenge of uh, uh, reforming the Department of Corrections in Kansas. And uh, uh, he's a, a very uh, capable man, very policy oriented as well as smart politically. Uh, to his right is Mark Levin, the Director of Policy for the Texas Public Policy Foundation. Uh, Mark really began a revolution in uh, uh, legislative uh, uh, attitudes towards uh, corrections. Uh, Texas is probably the toughest assignment anybody could have to try to reform a criminal justice system. And uh, Mark, working with uh, some very capable legislative leaders, and the Texas Public Policy Foundation as a base, which has great credibility. Uh, literally, we work, rework the Texas criminal justice system, making intelligent choices as to who could be incar should be incarcerated, uh, taking those that aren't a danger to society, uh, uh, you know, holding them accountable in other ways, taking the savings from that, putting it in drug treatment and mental health treatment, and uh, they've been able to close six prisons uh, so far, saved $5 billion for the public, and crime has dropped to the lowest point it's been since 1967. And it's been great in all the other states because if tough on crime in Texas, Texas can do it, it certainly can happen other, uh, other places. Uh, Grover Norquist, to my right, the president of Americans for Tax Reform. We all know him for his uh, leadership literally changing the landscape politically on the tax pledge and then enforcing it. Uh, which is so important that it have credibility. Uh, but uh, over 10 years ago, uh, Grover pulled me aside at a political conference and said, you know, conservatives aren't doing enough on criminal justice reform. We really need to make this part of the conservative movement. And uh, we have. He has been part of the effort, a driving force, traveling to states, speaking to legislators, doing op-eds, doing radio shows to help spread the message that conservative principles can give us a correction system that costs less, that protects us more. And uh, he's been a, an apostle of that. Uh, Julie Stewart, who's the founder and the president of Families Against Mandatory Minimums, uh, literally has shown what one person can do. Uh, her brother was convicted and got an absurdly long sentence. Uh, she was surprised at that and said, this can't possibly be. It turned out, yes, it can possibly be. And she said, this is wrong. This is uh, against our liberty. Uh, this uh, defy, uh, defies all sense of proportion. 
uh, and uh, founded Families Against Mandatory Minimums. She has a great uh, pedigree. She came from Cato uh, b <laughs> before that, uh, an institution we all love, and uh, literally has put mandatory minimums on the map to where we have strong bipartisan support for doing away with these one-size-fits-all sentences and instead tailoring it to the harm that's done and to the culpability of, of the people involved. Just to set the, the framework, right now as we speak, there are two million Americans behind bars. Two million. That's one out of every 100 adult Americans is currently behind bars as we speak. If you add in those on probation and parole, it's one out of every 31 Americans. That's an astounding amount of power to have the government exercising over such a large portion of our population. Now, of course, we need prisons. There are a lot of people that do terrible things that we're afraid of. But we've also expanded prisons to include a lot of offenses that by no means are morally uh, uh, reprehensible. Uh, they're bad simply because the legislature says they're bad. And one of the rubrics we use is prisons are for people we're afraid of, but we're filling them with people we're just mad at. And that's something that needs to, to change, and conservatives are a part of that. The system has a 40% recidivism rate, a failure rate of 40% of those that go through prison within three years are back in the prison system. So it's not even doing a good job of keeping us safe, changing the behavior of the prisoners that go in. We spend over $85 billion on corrections, and frankly, we're not getting the public safety that we're paying for, because we're paying uh, a lot for it. Prisons are the only uh, institution that expands by failing. The more they fail, the more they expand, and the more they cost us. Prisons are the second fastest growing portion of state budgets second only to Medicaid. And it's eating up money that could go for roads, uh, for um, schools, uh, for tax rebates. Uh, it's uh, gobbling up so much money and, and, and frankly, it's doing a terrible job at changing people's lives, make, uh, uh, changing the lives of offenders so that they can live as good neighbors with us. Um, the, uh, as I said, we're going to do this as sort of a Q&A, and Governor Brownback inherited a system that uh, was like most of the other departments of corrections in the country. It was burning through money at a tremendous rate, uh, car carving a bigger and bigger hole in the state budget, and a re recidivism rate uh, that was very high. And so, uh, Governor, I I'd like you to tell us the, the situation you inherited uh, what, you know, what principles you applied to help bring about the changes that you've done there. Thanks, Pat. Uh, appreciate that. And it, I want to start off by acknowledging Pat's longtime work in this. As long as I've been around uh, prison reform issues, Pat's been around longer. Uh, so, thank you. Through thick and thin, and he struggled with health issues, and he doesn't give up on it. So I, I just, I <laughs> admire that, and I appreciate it. And it's just, it's one of those great issues that I think conservatives really need to engage. Uh, I don't, I think we've gotten sometimes too stuck in the old mantra uh, on it that, uh, okay, you do the crime, you do the time. And that's when I first ran in 1994, that was one of the, the mantras I put up. Problem of it was that at some point in time, the time is done, and then you got a guy coming out, and we were having 60% recidivism rates. Uh, it was what we were having in our mm -hmm. state. 60% recidivism rates. Uh, so, you know, over time we've started to engage a number of these different policies and proposals to get that recidivism rate down. Uh, now we're getting around 30%, uh, and we need to drive this thing on down further. I carried the Second Chance Act, which was a bill designed to say we will help fund programs to get recidivism rates cut in half over a five-year time period. And the objective being recidivism, but at the end of it, what you've really got to do is work with the person that's there and the difficulty that they have. And so the things that we've been doing, particularly lately, engaging in big mentoring programs. I want a personal, I want a private mentor for everybody that wants one that's coming out of a Kansas prison. We get about 6,000, mostly men, out per year. 
and we've got just a little over 4,000 private mentors. First year recidivism rate, just under 9% for those with a mentor. Those that don't have a mentor, 21% recidivism rate in year one. Now the key here is you gotta have a good match. We organize that. You gotta have somebody on the outside with a good heart that wants to do it. A lot of it's the faith community. Uh, and then you need to do the match before the guy leaves prison. He needs to, you need to have the match happen at least six months before he comes out so that you can start building that relationship in there. And then it can't be just a pen pal. It's got to be somebody that 24-7, you're available, and you got to help them because we all have problems. Uh, and we're working that. The second piece, and this one is the bigger one, and I think we've got a lot more work to do on it, is the mental health piece of people in prisons. About 30 years ago, the country shut down all sorts of mental health hospitals, and the prisons ended up being the mental health institution. Uh, and this isn't working so well. We've got in Kansas, 37% of the adult male incarcerated have a mental illness. If you add that with a substance abuse, it's nearly 60%, a little more, of people incarcerated that have those two, one or both of those issues going on in their life. So what we started doing is setting pieces aside of the prison or mental health wings. They've done this in Sedgwick County. We're taking also now having places where when the person is incarcerated or arrested for doing something, instead of taking them to the jail, we're taking people to a halfway facility that deals with mental health or drug and substance abuse issues. And that's held the issues down. Because if you've got a, a, a guy that's got a mental health issue and you go and arrest him and put him in jail, do you think he's going to be doing better with his mental health issue when you put him in jail? He, probably not. This is probably going to exacerbate the situation. So we're trying to get him into a situation that is, is less confrontational and more works with the problem that the individual has. Moving forward, I want to use welfare reform dollars to help people graduate from high school. Because one of the things, if you, if you graduate from high school, your likelihood of going into prison goes down. So we're taking welfare dollars Jobs for America's graduates programs and really helping people with personal coaches while they're in high school, get them through high school. And we're getting a 96% graduation rate with that. And we're taking also welfare dollars to increase our fourth grade reading levels because one of the other markers is if you don't read by the time you're in the fourth grade, your likelihood of ending up in prison goes up as well. So we're taking those dollars and saying this will help us on public assistance and it helps us in our incarceration population as well. If we can get people a better start and then also work more with them once they're in prison. Pat, I've talked longer than I intended to. I'm delighted to be here and, and really pleased to see all the interest. This is a big topic conservatives need to own and come up with real ideas and it will be a good winner for us. This and poverty reduction I think are two of the big broader issues we need to engage because our solutions will work, the other's teams have not, and we need to show that to the American public. Yes. The things Governor Brownback has done show the practical solutions that applying conservative principles do. Mentoring, for instance. Government programs can't love people. People can love people. And Dr. King said, to change someone, you must first love them, and they must know that you love them. And that's what Do uh, Governor Brownback is doing, matching these men and women to help them with the difficult decisions, keeping them on the straight and narrow when they get out, holding them accountable. And a bureaucrat's not going to do that. Only a person of their own free will dedicated to it. And he's made that possible by emphasizing that, plus the education and the other things. He's on the cutting edge showing conservatives have real solutions. Grover, you've literally traveled this country speaking before legislative bodies, meeting privately with legislators. You've been carrying the torch for this. Uh, I think it's surprised all of us how uh, receptive conservative legislators are, especially Tea Party uh, folks in the states, if you talk about what the, the, the reson how this resonates with them. Sure. <clears throat> well, I've been working with you and right on crime um, for a number of years, and I can't overemphasize the importance that this, this started 
um, and has success in Texas. When I testified in Florida in the legislature, and I said, well, they did this in Texas four years ago, all of a sudden people looked up. They did it in Texas, okay, meaning it's not some Vermont idea. And four years ago, that's two election cycles. You mean nobody lost an election over it? Uh, elected officials need to know something safe, meaning safe for them to get past the next election. It's not fair to ask somebody, I've got this really great idea, <clears throat> it probably cost you your career, but why don't you try it? Um, that's not as strong a sales pitch as you might hope. Uh, so if you can say to somebody, they did this in Texas, which means serious people uh, were working on it, uh, and, and, and serious people who are not liberals on criminal justice issues, and two, it's been around for a while, and there have been examples of where this has worked and people win elections. Then it calms it down. Uh, this is one of those issues, criminal justice reform, um, prison reform, that where you get left-right agreement. And I want to make it very clear that is different, very different from bipartisanship. Bipartisanship in Washington, D.C., in most states, that you know, there's the stupid party and the evil party, and every once in a while they get together and do something on a bipartisan basis that's stupid and evil. Um, <laughs> by, they can agree, bipartisanship is when the Republicans and Democrats get together and agree to raise their pay, give themselves pensions, come up with campaign finance laws that kneecap competitors. Hey, no one should be able to challenge me. And the Republicans and Democrats can agree. So you, the present mess we have in each state, in the federal, that's the result of bipartisanship. That's the 70% of the mushy middle, not the hard left, not the hard right, but the seven, that, that basically have created the present mess we're in, budget-wise and everything else. They are not the people who are going to get us out of fixing the criminal justice system or anything else. But this allows us to have people on the right and people on the left. The ACLU has been very active on this, a number of the um, uh, NAACP. They have their own thoughts and reasons. This is, we want to make sure this destroys fewer lives, costs less money, and reduces crime. When we can explain the point is to, to drop the amount of crime in the country, to punish real criminals, and to keep dropping the amount of crime in the country down, uh, and that it's been continuing to drop in states that have reformed uh, as faster, faster than in states that, that, that don't, um, you both save money, are less disruptive in the lives of the community and in individuals' lives and families' lives, innocent family members whose lives are disrupted by how much time somebody spends in prison, uh, you can make the case that this is exactly where conservatives need to be. Well, what took us so long? Um, part of it was, and I know in my own view, I was working on all the things the government shouldn't do. And so I was in favor of getting them to stop doing things they shouldn't do in the first place. That seemed like a pretty good place to focus on, because even if you just cut it a little bit, they shouldn't be doing it anyway. Um, and stuff like punishing criminals and national defense, I figured the wardens and the prosecutors and the generals were making sure that was all efficiently run. Um, and so while we're focused over here, this got more and more expensive on criminal justice and prison issues, and a whole bunch of mistakes got made. And when the liberals brought up any problems, we looked and said, they're liberals, they're idiots, what do they know? And so th this continued to fester, and when conservatives began to look over, and I, I credit the, uh, the Christian uh, effort um, that, that you and others, uh, Chuck, Colson. Uh, Chuck Colson from, from my hometown, uh, uh, w focused on, and all of a sudden people went into prison, Democrats have focused on this because all their relatives are in prison. Republicans don't have, don't have as many relatives and friends who are in prison, and so it's been late, I know, the, but the ones who do get active. Um, and so it wasn't as, as in front of people, and I think the two things happened when, when, when uh, the fellowship went into the prisons, uh, and then when the budgets got uh, to be le difficult to bear at the state level, you had people saying, why does this cost so much? How much does it have to cost? So we now have right-left coalitions of people for principled reasons. This is not about compromise. I don't make this, this is not about compromise. We're not sitting down with the liberals and going, we want to punish criminals and you don't, so we'll punish them less. That's not it, okay? We are not cutting deals with the left. We are saying, we think that this is the effective way to reduce crime while doing less damage to individuals and the taxpayers who are also individuals and to the relatives of these people and the guys on the left have sim some similar 
thoughts, maybe for completely different reasons. But we can agree on some sets of policies that move things forward. And then when it's right-left, the reason why this has become a big issue quicker than others, I mean, the people who work on trying to get an issue forward, it takes them 20 years to get any attention. We get more attention because you have the odd bedfellows thing, and, and when you're, you know, you and the NAACP are agreeing on something, people go, oh my goodness, this is very interesting. Uh, that helps to get press for a good issue, okay? If it was a lousy issue, press would kill a lousy issue. Good, good advertising kills a bad product, press would kill, it, kill a bad product as well, but it's a good product, and it's a good set of reforms, and the fact that it's odd bedfellows, right-left cooperation, cats and dogs living together, you know, th this surprises people and it gives it attention. The other piece to that is that only conservative thought leaders, like you guys, can talk on an issue in a way that it makes elected officials who are Republicans feel comfortable doing something. They don't want to be attacked from the right. If they think they do something to maybe decide that you don't need to keep 75-year-olds in prison if they were bank robbers, because they're probably not going to be bank robbing banks if you let them out, um, and that there may be some ways to have higher touch probation, parole, and not as much $50,000 a year in California, keep a guy in cell for another year. Um, they need to know they're not going to be attacked from the right for being weak on crime. And the Democrats need to know that this won't be used against them for being weak on crime. And that's where conservative thought leaders and leftist thought leaders can talk to their own team, um, can, can move this stuff forward. And that's why I think it's moved forward now. The other reason it's important is we're not doing anything else for the next two years in Washington. Um, we have gridlock, right? Because Democrats want bigger government and the De Republicans want smaller government. And everyone has this stupid conversation about bipartisan compromise. Somebody wants to go east and somebody wants to go west. What would a compromise look like? If somebody wants bigger government, somebody wants smaller government, what's a compromise look like? On, so on the mega issues, there's no compromise. It's, it's two equally sized sumo wrestlers bouncing into each other for two years. And nobody gets knocked outside the ring. So because nothing's moving on those other issues, this is something where Rand Paul and um, Booker, Booker um, can get together, Mike Lee and... I get, you got to match these guys up. Each Republican has a Democrat that they're working with. But you got Rand Paul and Lee and uh, I don't Leahy know the and Durbin Booker. and Leahy. See, and I, I don't know the names Booker. of any Democrats. The um, <laughs> but they're linked up, and we're actually seeing legislation begin to move forward and take form. So the next two years, at the national level, federal level, and over the last several years and the years for it at the state level, we have a tremendous opportunity for real progress that will be less destructive, get fewer, punish real criminals, and get people from, recidiv from, from going back to prison, um, not by not rearresting them, but by not having to rearrest them. Uh, and this is, this, and it, again, the press likes it, they follow it, they cover it. We can make sure people don't get attacked for making reforms. I spoke with the new governor of Nebraska. He's the first guy I know as a conservative Republican who talked about right on crime ideas and they attacked him. And I said, well, how bad was it? He says, not at all, didn't work. Um, so he felt very comfortable that th those attacks on him didn't draw blood. So for all those reasons, now's the time that the center right is focused on this issue, having not focused on it as much in the past. And the press is willing to be supportive and covering of it because it's the only thing going on. And it's something we have time and energy to work on while we wait to elect a Republican president and do all the cool things that that entails. One of the, uh, the things that uh, has come up, you, you know, uh, Grover Kiddingly said, Democrats have relatives in prison, Republicans don't. Sadly, uh, because of the drug war, that's no longer the case. Uh, a whole bunch of Republican families have people in prison, people that were in possession of small amounts of drugs that are doing long sentences, and they're shocked uh, by them, plus all the business uh, type uh, offenses. The Supreme Court just decided one, whether somebody throwing three grouper overboard was a destruction of evidence under Sarbanes-Oxley, of all things. This is the type of prosecutions going on. One of the key things is that we not, not get bogged down in 
just numbers. It's putting a human face on it, that this is destroying human lives and families, uh, this great over-criminalization of our society. And Julie Stewart has done a phenomenal job on the technical and legal side, being an expert on it, but also putting human faces on these uh, offenders doing long stretches of time. And so, Julie, I'd like to you have you talk about what, what prompted you to do that, but how that's helped you build a bipartisan coalition. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you, Pat. Um, Pat alluded to the fact that I had a family member who went to prison. My brother was arrested for growing marijuana in Washington State in 1990, which is somewhat ironic since it's legal there to do that now. <laughs> but um, he still was over the threshold, even, even if he were doing it today. Um, but he was growing marijuana in a garage in Washington State. He and his friends got arrested. And his case, I think, even though it's a relatively small case, illustrates a lot of the problems that we have with mandatory minimums. And one of the first ones is why on earth did that case go federal. He was growing pot in a garage. Why? What's the federal nexus there? Why did the federal government need to pick that case up in the first place? Um, but this was 1990. The drug war was in its heyday, as Senator Brown, or Governor Brownback says. I knew him mostly when he was a senator, sorry. <laughs> um, and the question is, you know, everyone was saying you do the crime, you do the time, but how much time and who should decide and so that's one of the things that motivated me. I'm a non-lawyer. I'm simply the sister of someone who was arrested and convicted and was sentenced to prison for five years without parole for growing marijuana. Um, and it struck me at the time that he was sentenced, his judge had been on the bench for 25 years and said, I don't want to give you this punishment, but I have no choice. My hands are tied by these laws that Congress passed in 1986. And I was dumbstruck. I sort of felt federal judges had this awesome power to uh, deliver whatever sentence was appropriate for the individual. But in cases, crimes rather that carry a mandatory minimum sentence attached, the person closest to the defendant has absolutely no discretion over what the sentence should be. Instead, legislators, Nancy Pelosi if you like, is, are making decisions about what the sentence should be for defendants they've never laid eyes on. To me, that is utterly un-American. I think that we are so a country that values independ, uh, individualism. That individualism is completely lost when you sentence someone under a mandatory minimum sentence. Um, it's also been in my, I've done this for 23 years. It's been a long time. Um, my concern is that the escalation in punishment that we have seen as a result of the drugs, drug war has driven all sentences north. Um, in 1986, when mandatory drug sentences were passed, the average drug sentence for federal, sentence, federal sentencing was four years. Today it's nine and a half years. I don't believe that the average drug offender today is more than twice as dangerous as he or she was in 1986. And what have we gotten for that amount of over-incarceration that has occurred in this country? not much, an enormous budget deficit in states across the country, as Mark is better equipped than I am to talk about. Um, and although crime has dropped, crime has dropped in states that have reduced their prison populations at the same time. So it's the, the relationship, and I think the easy, both conservative and, Democrat, and uh, liberal sort of direction in the past two decades has been, you put more people in crime, you're gonna reduce, in prison, you're gonna reduce crime. Yes, if we locked up everybody in America, we probably wouldn't have much crime. But I think there's a cost benefit um, that we have to weigh very heavily. And we've reached way, way past that tipping point, I think. Um, I just want to just also add, I guess, sort of with the argument about, you know, how much time is enough. Um, I was talking to someone yesterday who's in prison for 15 years, a federal drug offender. Um, it was his third offense, so he was sentenced as a career criminal. Um, and when I read his priors, I was like, you've got to be kidding. Um, the last one, they were all small amounts of drugs, nothing more, more than like $300 um, in total. And the, the one before the one that he got his 15 years for, he sold 34 grams of marijuana. That's a tiny amount of marijuana. If you think of a sweet and low package as a gram, that's like 34 sweet and low packages. Okay, and then his, the offense for which he got the 15 years, he was growing 250 marijuana plants. Now that case went federal. Now if you read about it in the paper, you'd say, oh my goodness, you know, a career criminal. We want him off the streets. He was the, ran a pizza shop in Kentucky. He was supporting his wife and a brand new baby. His elderly father, who's 84, writes me these handwritten notes. Please help my son, please help my son, we need him home. 
he's done five years of his 15. I mean, his dad will be dead for sure before he gets out. What good is, what's the purpose? What good is being served by his incarceration? He could come out, he could support his kids, he could get hopefully back into the pizza business. Um, this is the recidivism you know, issue that there needs to be ways to help people coming out because almost everybody who goes to prison comes back and we have to be prepared to help them re-enter society. There are so many ridiculous barriers. When my brother came out, he wanted to be a, a realtor, and the, he went through all the real estate classes in Virginia, and the Board of Realtors in Virginia denied him the license to become a realtor because he had a felony record. Now, how is that helping him become a law-abiding, tax-paying citizen again? It's not. So I just urge you to, when you read these articles in the paper and you hear about cases, question whether or not that's the right sentence. Question whether or not that person really needs that much time because they are, as Pat said, people that you know, deserve a second chance, maybe even a fourth chance in this man's case. He recognizes that he needed some prison time. My brother says, I needed to be arrested. I needed some time to get my act together. I hear that for 20 years. I've heard that from parents. But how much time and who should decide? Not legislators who've never laid eyes on these people. Thank you. And, and how about government resources that go into it? Of the uh, crack powder disparity, which you've heard about the long sentences for crack uh, cocaine, only 14% of the prosecutions were for major traffickers. Why shouldn't we be concentrating on people shipping large amounts across international borders or state lines? Why are we going to the the local drug dealer on the corner and slamming them. Of course, we're not uh, justifying what they do, and there ought to be consequences for what we, they do, but with prosecutorial discretion, which we've heard so much about recently from the president, don't you think they should be concentrating on the major dealers? And one of the justifications for mandatory minimums is, well, this will get them to rat up the chain. That's wrong. They rat down the chain. They, they give somebody less than them, and the prosecutors go ahead and prosecute them because it adds to the number of prosecutions. It doesn't take more drugs off the street. A anyway, th this is an issue which there really is bipartisan support this year, uh, and it ranges from uh, very conservative to, to uh, very liberal, and I think there really are prospects. Not to say these people will go unpunished, but trying to make the harm match the harm that was done by the underlying crime uh, not exceeded. Now, Mark Levin, uh, I, I'm going to ask to talk about their experience in Texas, but not just Texas, in other states. Mark had the brilliant idea of right on crime. He literally, it sprung forth fully formed from his head. <laughs> you, you know, it, it, and, and it encapsulates it. And so we've set up uh, this uh, 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 statement of principles, and, and it's been endorsed by Ed Meese, uh, Newt Gingrich, uh, Asa Hutchinson, uh, David Keene, uh, Grover Norquist, Richard Vigory. It's Jeff literally Bush. Uh, uh, Jeb Bush, the, uh, you know, four former state attorneys general, Cuccinelli and Early from Virginia, Hal Stratton from New Mexico, Jim Petro from Ohio, credible people behind it. And it gives political cover uh, to people that stick their neck out and work on reforms. But Mark, talk about, a as you've gone to the states, what are the issues that cause conservatives to hesitate and that you've been able to overcome? Well, thanks, Pat. And let me just first say, Pat, you've been one of the most instrumental people in making Right on Crime a success. And of yes. course, one of our, probably our very first signatory so to our statement of principles. So, and in many ways, Pat had been meeting informally with David Keene and some of the other folks, uh, Tony Blankley before he passed away, and talking about these issues. And Right on Crime really served to formalize that and provide a platform for conservatives to move this issue forward. So thank you, Pat. And uh, we in Texas, uh, Right on Crime also kind of uh, served as a basis to take to other states what we had done in Texas. Uh, particularly in 2007, uh, when we were looking at a projected growth in our prison population of 17,000 over five years, that we would need to add 17,000 prison beds onto 155,000, and we computed the cost of building and operating all those beds would be over $2 billion over five years. So instead, we set about uh, an alternative plan that involved more drug courts, uh, really identifying the low-risk and nonviolent offenders who could be served through other approaches, stronger probation. And so, uh, 
Our prime rate is, as Pat said, the lowest since 1967. It's fallen further than the national drop in crime. And um, I think that that has given us the credibility to go to other states and uh, say, look, why don't you follow uh, what Texas has done? And thankfully, uh, conservative governors have really been the ones stepping up to the plate and leading the charge. And so just to give you a few examples, Governor Nathan Deal in Georgia has presided over three straight, uh, really significant adult and juvenile justice reform packages. And uh, in the most recent election, he decided to campaign on it. He sent out uh, mail pieces talking about the drop in both crime and incarceration. And um, he won uh, stronger uh, margins, uh, stronger uh, votes in areas that traditionally do not vote for a Republican. Uh, Governor Kasich has campaigned on this as well in the last election, including at a black church in Cleveland. Um, so when we started this thing, it was kind of like, how do we convince elected officials, conservatives, that they won't lose their job if they support some of this? Now, many of them are using it to help keep their job. So I think that's a great, uh, great trend. Um, and uh, just to give you a couple of other examples, in Mississippi, Governor Phil Bryant presided over a very successful package. He announced uh, before the legislative session, I want to bring right on crime to Mississippi. And we said, we're there. Um, and then uh, I think South Carolina is a great story. In 2010, they passed a comprehensive reform package, reduced penalties on low-level drug possession. It actually increased penalties on a few crimes that were violent, but weren't properly classified as violent crimes. But it also made sure people coming out of prison and had supervision. They weren't released to the streets by maxing out their terms. It improved the use of risk assessment there to make sure people are on the right level of supervision when they're on probation. And since then, their crime rate's down 17%. Their incarceration rate is also down 14%. So there's a lot to love here. Less spending, less crime. And one of the issues we haven't talked about today that we really should is victims of crime and getting restitution to someone who's had something stolen from them, for example. And one of the things that's important to realize is people on probation pay 96 times more in restitution than people in prison. Now, obviously, there are people that need to be in prison. Uh, but we have a system today where the government takes the first cut when it comes to fines and fees from people who have, tend to have very little money. And the victim is at the end of the line as far as getting restitution. And that's wrong. Um, we need to go back to the idea that the, it's the individual who's primarily the victim of a property crime, for example, not the government. Um, and so um, I think that's a very important one. And, and let me also just touch on our work on overcriminalization. We have a reception coming up. I hope, hope you all got an invitation to the Right on Crime uh, Oysters reception. And it's based on the fact that in Texas, we have 11 felonies relating to harvesting oysters, harvesting them at night, uh, catching them in the wrong place, etc. Uh, and this is a problem throughout the country. At the federal level, there's uh, the Congressional Research Office counted over 4,500 federal crimes, and then they gave up. And that doesn't even begin to get to all the regulatory crimes, those that are created by federal and state agencies every day of the week when they designate certain administrative rules as having criminal penalties. And we need to uh, get rid of that ridiculous delegation of power from our elected officials to unelected bureaucrats. So there's so much we still need to do on this issue. And uh, I think, though, that it is truly conservatives who have the credibility. Because when we began right on crime, we really felt uh, you had people on the left saying society causes crime, not individuals. And then you had people on the right saying, lock everyone up, throw away the keys, who cares what it costs? And so uh, that's not true to limited government, to individual liberty, to the principles we hold dear. So we have taken, I think, a course that's different from the left in many important ways, but it's also one that truly embodies conservative principles. And so we look forward to kind of continuing this great progress. And uh, I think that uh, this is an issue, as Grover said, that something can get done in the next two years on. Yeah. The power of the prosecutor is um, basically unrestrained. And with this many crimes, again, 4,500 at the federal level, all of us commit a violation of that inadvertently. You have no way of knowing what's in all these laws. And yet, you can be picked out for prosecution. It reminds me of what Berea, who was Stalin's head of his secret police, said. You bring me the man, I'll find the crime. And with that many statutes on the book, if they want you, they can nail you. And that's not good. It's not good for liberty. And th that's part of this effort. We are involved in the, 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 the specifics of sentencing and mentoring uh, uh, programs and risk assessments which are very important, but it's also part of the bigger picture of liberty, keeping our people free from uh, overbearing government. The, uh, you, know, the, you look at the Bill of Rights 
and it had to do with restraining the government, the bad experience that the colonists had uh, from the British. And so part of, uh, and I see in the audience, Sidney Powell, a former uh, federal uh, appellate lawyer who uh, worked for the Department of Justice, but has written a great book you ought to read. It's called License to Lie. And it lays out chapter and verse of the cheating, lying, suborning perjury, hiding witnesses that went on not only in the Enron case, but Senator Ted Stevens' case, which was so outrageous, the judge set up a special prosecutor to look at their, at the conduct of the prosecutors. And yet, they defeated Ted Stevens, and with that, that vote elected Harry Reid, majority leader in the Senate, and passed Obamacare. So the Department of Justice prosecutors with this phony case they brought against Ted Stevens, literally changed the course of the republic. That's the power of the prosecutor. Sidney Powell's book is just terrific. It gives you chapter and verse. It's called License to Lie, and it'll open your eyes to, to that. Anyway, we'd love to uh, uh, field questions from Paul. <laughs> All right. This is Governor. Well, um, two things, actually. First of all, I think that the <laughs> well, speaking of dads in the room, Grover's dad is here in the room. Yes, oh, really? Uh, oh. So good to have you. Yeah. Fine, sir. Oh, my goodness. Oh, that's great. You'll be like might, that one day. might I inquire of your age? What? May I, how old are you? Do you that's mind saying? Bad question. To 83. Ask. 83. Okay. I was wondering if you were. That's my dad's 84. Uh, and so just glad to see it. Yeah, I'm happy to sign it. Uh, I think there's a lot of places where you can more effectively spend uh, dollars, and here's and this is something that uh, that we can do, and uh, and put it in there. Uh, we probably ought to, uh, let's get to we probably should get to as many questions as possible, Pat. So I'll let. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yes. Back there. Mark, you spoke. Well, yeah, I mean, I think that the reason, one of the reasons that we've seen this shift is, I mean, I think the Tea Party brings with it an inherent skepticism of government that the mushy middle, to quote Grover, doesn't have. So, you know, uh, there are some people on kind of the libertarian left, like the ACLU, who have a skepticism of government about things like wrongful convictions, where there are cases like we had in Texas with Michael Morton, where prosecutors obstructed DNA testing, so you had the wrong person in jail for 30 years. Um, so, but conservatives, the key is, with, especially with the Tea Party's positive influence, the, the right is now saying, we're going to apply the same skepticism that we apply to other government programs, like education and health care, to criminal justice and corrections. And that's, that's pretty much why I think you've seen the shift you have. So you're absolutely right. Maryland's an interesting example. They passed an earned credits bill where people on probation could earn time off their probation term by completing certain benchmarks, paying all their restitution, getting a degree, holding a job, doing the very things that we know reduce recidivism, can earn their way off of probation instead of just being a standardized time. It's like everything else in society. It's based on your conduct. Your behavior is whether you get ahead. And so, um, but it was to pass that earned time credit bill, we had ALEC, which has been a great partner in this, the American Legislative Exchange Council, it's one of our model ALEC bills. And uh, so we had the conservative Maryland legislators who were members of ALEC and the black Democrats, and it was the mushy middle, the moderate Republicans and the moderate uh, Democrats that, were, that, that ultimately were defeated and the bill did pass. So absolutely right, Steve. Yeah. Can, I, sure. can I just add, though, that in Michigan in 1998, um, Governor Engler signed a bill to 
eliminate the life sentence for first offenders possessing um, 650 grams of cocaine or heroin, which is about the size of a, a powdered sugar box. And he got no blowback for that. The Republican legislature got no blowback for that. And that was 1998. That's a long time ago. Even And in this past year, in 2014, in Florida, Governor Rick Scott signed a bill to change the gun mandatory sentencing laws down there, as well as some of the prescription pill mandatory sentencing laws. No blowback. I mean, there are, you know, I think, having done this for 20-some years, without Republicans, we can't move this ball. It is definitely a Nixon goes to China situation, and the Republicans have been incredibly helpful. Yes, Howard. Howard Wolf, a retired detective. From the skeptics in the room, drug dealers accept as a condition of employment the death penalty. Eight or ten are shot, shot dead every day. The idea back in '86 was if you make these mandatory minimums 20 years or whatever, that you would reduce the number of drug dealers in America. This is a false premise. My question for Governor Brownback is. Are t is today, are, are politicians asking my profession the tough questions in terms of the effectiveness of the entire uh, incarceration system, the entire idea of uh, getting tough on crime, and saying, is this really what you think is good for America, or is it my profession making $82 billion on the drug war says, you know, uh, mandatory minimums are working? But what kind of feedback can you get from my profession? Uh. Yeah, that's a good question, and, and most of the discussion with law enforcement is really about what can we do to get enough people in law enforcement right now, because it's actually a hard profession to hire people into. That's what we're spending time and upping pay to uh, get people into it. Um, and it's, you know, what, what can we do to provide protection to law enforcement? Uh, so that people be willing to come into it. Those are the discordant discussions that ought to happen, though, like what you're saying. What, what actually is effective? And I don't know that those discussions take place. One of the other things that I think is the most effective thing to do uh, is go spend a night in prison. Uh, I've done it three times of my own volition. I was never convicted <laughs> of anything. So, I mean, I, I went in on my own. I came out on my own. Uh, <laughs> But honestly, I, I, I did it in Louisiana, and I did it at a minimum security facility and a, uh, and a, um, a maximum security facility. And just one of the things I think as a legislator governor uh, that you really need to get the, the smell and the taste and the feel mm -hmm. uh, of a place. Last time when I went into state prison, I took a, a guy I'd recently appointed to be on the bench, a judge in, uh, and stayed the night uh, too. And just... I, that may be what we ought to have everybody do, just so that you get that you get that sense mm -hmm. of what this is. It was, it was very very enlightening to me, honestly, and it was a, it was a good thing. I came out of the one in Angola, Louisiana, and I had a Kansas State University sweatshirt on. Huh. Uh, yeah, that's a that was a bad move on my part because the <laughs> KU basketball coach posted it in the locker room saying. Uh, Senator Brownback recruiting for K State. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, so it's it an in state rivalry uh, thing, you know. <laughs> well, how great to have a governor that's willing to do that, though, mm -hmm. to take himself and take himself. <laughs> Yes, ma'am. Oh, yeah. yeah, that's. Yeah. Well, as far as I know, uh, the Congress hasn't been able to get those figures. Uh, yeah. That, uh, yeah. We don't yeah. make policy off of worst case analysis, worst case no, stories. And a, and a judge in Oregon who let a pedophile go for nothing. There are cracks in the system. There are always I cracks in the it. system. There's cracks in the system, okay? But so many times you read in the paper where, the, like this um, newscaster that was killed in that uh, taxi cab, how many times from Sunday did that guy, like nine arrests prior? Uh, oh, 
Yeah, but uh, but uh, uh, the, 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 the other side of the coin is, look at Chuck Colson. Look at the great good he did. And yet, if we had said, oh, you know, cast him out forever, he has the mark of Cain. Uh, you know, uh, frankly, some of the people uh, who uh, have made great contributions to our country have done time. They've learned from it. They've corrected their ways. They've gotten a moral compass. And uh, that's when prison works. But let, let's get to some other questions, too. Well, if I, I I'm, I'm okay. responding too much, but... And that to me, this isn't about being soft on crime. Mm, this, no. is a, this is about, look, if, if you did the crime on these things, I believe you should serve time for it. I, I am not, and I've signed bills to do that. What I'm just saying is most of these guys are going to get out at some time. And I want, it, I want while we've got you, let's get, let's get you in a better position so that you're not back in here and you're not costing us more money and you're not doing more of this stuff. And by the way, 37% of them have mental illnesses. And we need to deal with that issue because if you don't, while you got them, you're going to deal with them afterwards. And, and so that's what, that's what I'm looking at. All volunteers. Patrick, in verse, years ago from Miami coming up the interstate, the Atlantic Coast, what is the proportion oh, of yeah. the introduction of actual drugs going north to Boston and yeah. from Boston South from money to the feds? Yeah. Uh, this is the uh, civil asset forfeiture, which is truly a scandal. We're told they need to be able to seize our private property, homes, cars, cash, uh, to stop the war on drugs. I don't have the figures for 95, but for I-40, which is the same situation, eastbound on I-40 are the drugs coming into Nashville. Westbound on I-40 is the money coming out of Nashville. A reporter for Channel 5 there in Nashville counted them and looked at the reports and found it was 10 to 1 seizures westbound rather than eastbound. Now, if the police had wanted to stop the drugs, to interdict it from going into the city, you would have seen the arrests on the eastbound lanes. That isn't where they were being arrested. It was the westbound lanes, 10 to 1, because that's the cash they get to keep, which they buy fancy cars, MRAPs, military equipment. They've even bought um, margarita machines with it, a, uh, a Zamboni machine one police chief did, another bought a tanning bed, uh, which his wife used. Uh, so uh, this, it's a misnomer that, uh, and there's a simple, and all that money is off budget. It's not voted on by the city council or the state legislature. That's just a slush fund for the police department. There's a simple thing to stop that. Require a conviction before any, uh, anything is uh, seized. Pat, I, I send I sent a letter to uh, the legislators in Virginia, co-signed by the head of the ACLU, saying if you're going to seize people's property, you should first get a conviction, mm -hmm. not arrest the guy, <laughs> seize his property, car, money, or whatever, and then I, they lose a little interest in the conviction after, yeah. <laughs> after that. And they, the cops, came to testify to the legislators and they said, we, uh, we really need this money, it's part of our budget now. Mm -hmm. And the legislators didn't pass the reform of mm -hmm. uh, the asset seizure. I mean, so they didn't say, hey, we're fighting crime. They didn't say, hey, we're stopping drugs, even if they're a little mm -hmm. late in the game on that route. They said, we want the money. And if you don't let us steal it, we'll make you raise taxes to steal it and you'll lose an election. Um, it, it, I mean, it is really awful. This is the problem we're fixing is not some minor problem. This this is millions and millions. You know, Two point four billion the U.S. Marshals has of yeah. seized property. Two point four billion. Yeah. yeah. Well, Henry Hyde had a great yeah. bill on it, but it didn't go far enough. He uh, he had to make compromises with it. And but, but you're quite extreme. right. Henry, Henry Hyde, conservative, had the bill to fix this before it. 
got watered down somewhat. Right. But he, so we, we, we did this once before. Right. We got a bite at the apple. We got to come back and do and more. And Jim Sensorbrenner is going to carry a bill this year on it, which is good. Watch, watch it. Not the hotel room, the whole hotel. Yeah. 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 And this, this was a family hotel. This is not, not that it would be justified if it were Marriott or a big chain, but this was a family yeah. hotel. This was their assets. This is their living that had been in their family generations. And it's gone by executive fiat. And they were never charged with a crime. The only allegation was that people staying there had used drugs, as you say, with thousands of people having stayed there. And in the hearing, the burden is on the property owner to prove that every dime is legitimate, not vice versa. The government doesn't have to prove it, that it's uh, ill-gotten. It, the burden is on the owner. You want to get some more questions? Yes. Well, I think that's right. In fact, one of the recommendations is that we have up there is to read the Blue Tent Sky, the Brian Aiken story about New Jersey's, you know, he was transporting a gun from his mother's house to his house and anyway, got arrested and got convicted for it. Um, the gun mandatory minimum sentences are awful. A lot of them are literally the gun was in the room and you still get five years in prison as long as you're, you know, doing something else. So um, we very much hope that that will be an issue that the legislative bodies both state and federal are willing to look at. I mean, we had great success in Florida last year. I'm looking behind you because our um, state policy director, Greg, raise your hand, mm -hmm. um, did all of this good work back, uh, to prevent the cases where, that you've heard about where the f war shooting a warning shot and the person says, you know, that, that flees, goes and reports you and says, you know, you, were, you scared him and they arrest the person that shot for, for aggravated assault. And the person's like, wait a minute, I'm just like protecting my family or my you know, loved ones, and goes to trial thinking he can prove this, and under the letter of Florida law, aggravated assault is discharge of a firearm, and so they get convicted, and then the judge has no choice but to sentence them to 20 years in prison. Um, if you go to our fam booth downstairs in, at number 600, we have this great story of Orville Wallard who had that happen to him. Um, but so thanks to fam's work in Florida, especially Greg, Newburn, um, we made that reform that no longer will it automatically, aggravated assault automatically trigger um, the mandatory 15 years, but it wasn't done retroactively, so those people that were you know, stuck with that are still stuck in prison serving their 15 years. Ma Yes, uh, let me address that. I think, you know, first of all, a lot of the uh, things that have passed have been only limited to state employment. Our view is certainly it's not the role of the government to tell private businesses, you know, what can be on their uh, job criteria. Uh, but um, our solution in Texas, which is what we have, is called non-disclosure. Now, you can get an expunction where your records are shredded if you're exonerated. The non-disclosure, however, is available if you have been convicted and received deferred adjudication and for most, you know, non-violent offenses. And so if you comply with your deferred adjudication, you do everything you're supposed to on your probation, uh, let's say five years later, you can apply for an order of non-disclosure. And so that's where the government, I mean, it's the government that created these records to begin with. So the solution is for the government to then say, look, you got, you got your deferred adjudication, it was deferred, now you've proven yourself as law-abiding, it was a nonviolent offense, 
it's off your record. Now, when you get a non-disclosure, the police can still see it, the prosecutors can still see it, it could still be used to enhance if you had another conviction, but it does enable people to fill out those applications and say, I haven't been convicted of an offense. Um, and so that's our view, is that the, gov that the government created these records and the government, uh, we need to have a public policy where you don't have a scarlet letter that if you were convicted of something when you were 18, it's not still on your record when you're 80 years old, particularly if it's a nonviolent offense. Well, one, uh, I, I would dissent a little from that. Getting a job is essential if these folks are going to get back on their feet. On the other hand, that might be valuable information to an employer uh, to decide if the act may involve a danger to other employees or their clients. The solution is a free market one, which some employers are doing now, which is they take that box off the application so that your application is reviewed and they look at your talents and ability, and if they decide at that point, without knowledge of any conviction, that they'll invite you in for an interview, that's where they then ask it, because they can then evaluate whether the conviction might affect the employees. But it, it stops them, for, they don't automatically toss you out just because of the conviction. They really look at whether you might be a good employee. I think that's a good solution for the private sector. And if we could get more employers to do that, it, it would be better off. Some employers, uh, th th there's a, 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 a galvanizing plant up in Pennsylvania where uh, the uh, COO had said, let's hire ex-offenders. And his boss said, why the hell should we do that? And the, the COO said, because Jesus told us to. And the boss said, well, OK, let's try it, see if it works. <laughs> <laughs> well, it turned out over half their employees now are ex-offenders. He says he made it for moral reasons, but it was the best business decision he made because they're so grateful for the job. They show up on time. They do the hard work because they know what it's like not to have it and, and to go back. And they self-police. They look out. The other inmates, or former inmates, they say, keep your nose clean. Stay in line. We don't want to ruin it for the next guy. And it's turned out great. He now has a standing offer with the local prison. You tell me which inmates you think would be good employees. I'll hire everyone. That's over half of his employees are ex-offenders. Totally done through the free market without any government coercion at all. Yep. Yes. A few weeks ago, um, they had a march for Mark Luther King. They stopped at just one uh, gas station where this first person was killed by a white cowboy. Yes. And they stopped him for a few minutes. And then they went back and they talked to him Well, you know, and that's a great comment. And one of the ones we forgot to talk about in the last question is uh, occupational licensing. We found we were training people in prison in Texas to cut hair, and then they couldn't get a barber's license because they had had a drug conviction 10 or 15 years ago. So, you know, the, it's like in the Hippocratic Oath, do no harm. The first thing is we need to get rid of the barriers that the government is putting in uh, to these people being self-sufficient. Um, but beyond that, as you said, you know, it's a mentoring, it's the human connection that a bureaucrat 
uh, simply can't do. And so um, I think that uh, uh, the reality is it's not, some of the programs in the past decades ago were about self-esteem for offenders and you just ended up with a more confident criminal. Whereas now we've got things like motivational interviewing where you're actually saying, think about the things you've done wrong. What is What have you done that's caused the problems you have now and how can you do today, this week, next month differently so you don't have those problems. So it's a different type of intervention than just making people feel good about something that they really shouldn't feel good about. Yeah. 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 One thing watch for at the national level, um, there's going to be an effort to do an equivalent of the base closing commission concept for federal laws, 4,500 um, federal laws. And when, when we had too many military bases in the United States, the Pentagon didn't want them, but some congressman or senator had done that 20 years earlier to win votes, and you had all these bases that were very expensive. We didn't need them. They wanted to get them down, but if they picked them, Congress would go nuts and say, no, no, don't shut any of them. So they set up a commission who would come up with a bunch of them to be closed, and unless Congress voted no and the president signed the no, then they were closed down or reorganized. And we save billions and billions of dollars with um, military bases better organized. The goal here, and legislation is being put together, to take the 4,500, get a bunch of judges, to sort of broad overview of judges and lawyers and so on, and say, okay, which of these 4,500 laws do we perhaps not need because they're duplicate of state laws and others? Th there's a federal law against carjacking um, because years ago when there was carjacking in all 57 states, banned carjacking already. Um, <laughs> but somebody held a press conference and he wanted to say, I am against carjacking. Well, nobody would go to your press conference if you're against, you know, to be against carjacking. I got a federal law I'm introducing because carjacking is bad. Then people came to his press conference, then he had to pass the stupid law. So you have a federal law as well as a state law. Well, you're never gonna pass, never, Congress is never gonna get together and legalize carjacking <laughs> at the national level, despite the fact that it's already covered at state level. But you could have a commission that said, here are the 57 laws that are clearly already done at the state level and there's not a reason, so we say let's drop those. And over time, we could begin to prune back some of the 4,500 and no congressman would have his fingerprint on legalizing X, uh, even though that's not what was going on. That, that's really important. I remember Barry Goldwater in the conscience of a conservative said his object was, I think, to repeal three laws for every one that passed, something like yeah. that. And I think that's uh, an average. We'll take one more question, then we've got to cut this off. Yes, sir. Yes. No, do, do two. Get the guy behind him, too. Okay. Yeah, All right. Because he's All right. been waiting. You've been waiting. Patiently. Okay. You and then the person by. We'll take two more. Okay. Uh, you talked about the difficulty that you know, people have getting jobs that because they've been convicted of crime. I'm interested if someone could comment on the problem people have if they've been arrested for a crime. Mm -hmm. If you're arrested, a law mm -hmm. enforcement agency may report that to the FBI criminal database. Mm -hmm. And then even if the charge is dropped or you're found innocent, okay. mm -hmm. uh, and this request made to expunge that, rec that arrest record, the FBI is not obligated to do it. Mm -hmm. now, increasingly, employers are using help outsourcing the background and the pre-employment mm -hmm. screening to include background investigations. And one of the things these companies do is access the FBI's uh, criminal database that shows the arrest records. So people who the charges have been dropped or they're found innocent and supposed to be expunged, they're still on the arrest they're record. They're still on there. And yeah. the employer doesn't even call them back. In right. Case, it's probably for an Actually, so they've they checked on it some of those services have ac inaccurate information, not just that it's on the FBI, but it's inaccurate because as, you know, databases get built, uh, it, it gets corrupted and, and, and it's basically a, uh, a veto. I, you know, if there's any hint of a problem, you're out of the running uh, because the job market is, that, that is a very serious problem and there's been some efforts to try to clean up, get those databases cleaned up to require 
that they use a reputable source, not one of these bad ones. But I don't know the status of it. I don't know if any of the rest. Well, we passed another ALEC model bill on this and saying that there has to be a final case disposition before things go into a database. So that way, uh, it should not, in, until you're convicted, there should not be a, a record created in you know a federal or state database. And that uh, would solve the issue. But once it's like a genie out of a bottle, once it is created and promulgated on the internet, one company sells it to another uh, criminal background data company, it's very hard to rein that back in. Although we passed some laws in Texas saying if you don't update your records to, for example, uh, uh, include a non-disclosure, if someone subsequently got a non-disclosure, then there can be penalties for that. Mm -hmm. Yes, last question. Well, we haven't taken a position on that issue. I think the focus really ought to be on employment, housing. People can rent an apartment. Um, we have we did a bill last session in Texas where saying employers can't be sued in most instances simply for the fact of hiring an ex-offender. And there's a bill this session uh, would say landlords can't be sued simply because they rented to an ex-offender. And there's exceptions for rapists and things like that. But um, I think that it's um, that we ought to focus on those things that stop people from getting ahead in society, and and those things that also interfere with uh, reducing recidivism rates. So. Um, you know, it's uh, the voting issue is really more of a political question. Um, and obviously there's, you know, nobody in prison can vote. Uh, obviously the question comes, when do you get your, and in Florida, for example, there's a commission you can apply to that, uh, uh, that's been going on for a while. So, but that's really not an issue that Right on Crime has addressed. Yeah, if I could, I, I share that concern. Uh, there have been a number of studies, and when I was talking about how Democrats have more relatives in prison, I was thinking of a study uh, that one of the groups on the left did, which said, gee, if, we'd had, if all ex-felons could have voted, we'd have beat Nixon, and they went through a series of elections, because under their calculation, 90% of um, ex-felons were Democrats. So that, that's their number. This is a Soros-supported effort to, to look at it. Um, yes, the left tends to focus on that. I would suggest the following as, as a beginning, and that is, anyone who should have the right to vote restored, and at some point, some people, you, might, might well, even for felonies. Um, but at what point? Uh, they should, that should only happen at the same time that their Second Amendment rights are restored. Because if somebody is trusted to, to vote and therefore wield power over others through the state, you better tell me you also trust them with a gun. And that ought to keep some of our friends on the left from jumping out and going, we're not interested in jobs, we're not interested in all this other stuff, we just want them voting. Um, because then they have to decide do they really also respect their Second Amendment? The Second Amendment is not child of a lesser God. The Second Amendment is every bit as important, and frankly, if somebody tells you, in your city you could have your Second Amendment rights or the right to vote for the mayor, choose, I think most people would rather have their Second Amendment rights. Um, but we'll grant that it's even, it, you know, they're, they're not, but one's Second Amendment rights are not less. I think that the center-right guys, when this comes up in the state legislatures and in the federal government, if we insist on equality there, that should stop any unseemly push. I mean, there's some point at which you might say to somebody, yes, you can have your voting rights back. But that's not the point of this. The point is to make sure that they're not criminals and that we're not wasting a whole bunch of money making them less employable and more likely to have problems. And if, if we can't trust you with a gun, then we certainly can't trust you to vote to be in charge of the guys with the guns who point them at the rest of us. I mean, this is no. Let me, uh, let me uh, respectfully dissent yeah. here. This uh, is not a consensus uh, issue. Yeah. Uh, first of all, I like, politically, I love Grover's strategy <laughs> because the left is really pushing hard for this. Uh, but as Monica Crowley said, Pat, you're falling on your sword for people that don't care. Most ex-offenders are not going to vote. It's not of interest to them. 
So, you know, it, it's much ado uh, uh, about really what will be a small number. But for those that are, when the government, when the judge puts the hammer down and sentences you, you're banished. You're banished from the kingdom. You know, you're beyond the pale, literally, was what that used to be. At some point when you've paid your price to society, when you've paid your debt, done your prison time, finished probation or parole, shouldn't there be a point at which the government officially says you're now accepted back into the community? And at what cost, I, I mean, it's a, a small gesture to say you're allowed to vote and you're now part of the commonweal again. Uh, and uh, I, you know, I, I don't understand the great concern. I, th I think it's an unstated idea that this horde of, uh, uh, you know, uh, ex-felons is going to sweep down the streets and, and vote on and block, you know, uh, for liberal Democrats. And, you know, uh, I, I was in prison for 29 months. Inside prison there, uh, it's really funny. They love to watch sports, obviously, but cop shows. And you know who they root for? They root for the cops. <laughs> you know, they, uh, you, you know, it, uh, the death penalty would pass overwhelmingly in prison because uh, they, 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 they know uh, the, the characters they're dealing with. So I, I think there's great concern about it. And frankly, I, I don't think it's thought through as to what's the danger, what's the harm. And I see a great positive good to the, the ceremonial acceptance back into the body politic. I think there are only 13 states that prohibit felons from voting at this point, so it's pretty much accepted across the country. I know my brother would vote Republican <laughs> down the line. <laughs> yeah, Chuck Colson did, and I got my rights restored, and I vote uh, Republican or Libertarian. So, <laughs> anyway, uh, we appreciate this time so much. There are some websites that you think, mine is real easy for the ACU, it's justice.acu.foundation. And uh, we have a newsletter, we'll keep, up, uh, keep you up to date on the bills that are pending that we've talked about. Uh, but especially be active locally. Talk about this among your friends because you'll be surprised what strong, uh, the strength of conservative feeling on this, they've just been hesitant to say it. And once you come out and say, hey, you know, I've been thinking about, you'll find most conservatives agree with us. This is the mainstream of the conservative movement, what you've heard here. You also might find someone that you wouldn't realize has someone in prison. I almost uh -huh. asked when I started this session how many of you have ever had anybody, know anybody in prison. Because usually in a room this size, somebody's hand will go up. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's touching a lot of lives. Mm -hmm. Thank you Thank so you. much.